Uh, so today we have with us Brian Raposa. He works um, he's on the board for the Tropical Audubon Society. He is also a longtime uh, teacher at Mass and one of the teachers of the year there. Uh, very well liked and very, very knowledgeable about birds. And that's what he's going to talk to us today about, uh, Miami's Backyard Birds. And with that, I will hand it off to Brian. Brian, you see the Habitats that birds live in, in um, cities and, and places that are otherwise inhabited by people, are backyards. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, Miami's backyard birds. So this is uh, one of our introduced parrots. This is a um, red mast or parakeet. And I'll tell you how to tell the difference between parrots and parakeets. It's all in the tail. But um, there are lots of introduced species in Miami, but there is also um, some native species. So we're going to, going to be talking about both of those. So my objectives for this presentation, I have two of them. One is to just give you idea, an idea of the diversity of birds in South Florida and even diversity of birds that can be found in backyards. This in this presentation, I'm going to show you uh, photographs of nearly 100 different species of birds, and that's not all of them. That's probably only a third of the birds that can show up in backyards here in Miami. If I showed you all of them, we'd be here until tomorrow. So I had to limit it to uh, just some of the highlights. So that's one objective, is to just give you an idea of how many different kinds of birds you can see in backyards here in Miami. But the other objective is to give you an idea of how you can make your backyard more attractive to birds. So at the end of the presentation, I'll give you some ideas of how you can help birds. Um, because backyards are a very important habitat for many birds, especially migrant birds. They use backyards and small parks as what is called stopover habitat. As they're migrating in the spring from their wintering grounds to the south, all the way up to their breeding grounds to the north, they can't make it in one flight, especially if the weather is bad and it prevents them from flying. So they look for what is called stopover habitat. And if a backyard is attractive to a bird, the bird can use that backyard as stopover habitat. So cumulatively, all the backyards, if they're attractive enough for birds, and I'll, exp I'll explain to you how a backyard can become attractive to birds. If all those backyards are attractive to bird, that pr provides lots of stopover habitat. And why that's important is that in urban areas, we've lost so much in the way of natural habitat. So in order to try to give some of that habitat back to these birds, backyards play a very, very important role. So I'm going to break down the presentation into several different categories of birds. I'm going to start with the year-round residents, those birds 
that really don't migrate from Miami. They're here year round. So birds that you're probably familiar with, like the northern cardinal or the blue jay. We're going to talk about a group of birds that are called visiting breeders. These are birds that are not here year round. In the winter time, they're usually south of Miami. And then in the spring, they come to Miami or South Florida in general. And that's when they nest in the spring and the summer. And then in the fall, they go back to their wintering grounds. So a couple of examples that I'll give you now of visiting breeding birds. One of the most beautiful birds of prey we have, the swallowtail kite. That's this bird here to the left. And then this bird here is a gray kingbird. So gray kingbirds are only here from about April until about September or October. And then in the wintertime, they're south of here. The next group that I'll talk about are migrants and winter visitors. So these are birds that like the visiting breeders, they're to the south of us, usually in the wintertime. Or they may stay here for the winter. Some of them will stay all winter, and then they'll go back to their breeding grounds in the spring. <clears throat> Some birds will only be migrating through Miami in the spring or in the fall, and they don't stay for the winter. So we have a very short window every spring and fall to see those kinds of birds. So those are called migrants. We're going to talk about eruptive birds. Now, most migrants and winter visitors, you can expect to see them year after year after year. They, every year, they show up in the spring or they show up in the fall. And then for some of them, they'll stay for the winter. But eruptive birds are different in that they're more un unpredictable. Let me backtrack a little bit to the migrants and the winter visitors, because I didn't mention uh, what my two examples are. Does anyone know what this bird is here? That's a bird that uh, it migrates, and many of them also winter here. It's a type of warbler. That's called an American red start. So I'll show you that bird again. It's one of about 40 different species of warblers that either migrate through Miami or winter in Miami. So you can see those in your backyard. And then this one, some of you may be familiar with. It's a type of? Yeah, it's a ruby-throated hummingbird, which is our only native hummingbird. It's the only hummingbird that breeds in Florida. But I will show you that there's an opportunity to see other hummingbirds in Florida, but only rarely. OK, let's go back to the eruptives. Eruptives, as I mentioned, are very unpredictable in their migration patterns. They tend to only show up in South Florida when their food supply in the winter is not sufficient enough further north. So does anyone know what this bird is? Robin. Yeah, American robin. So this is a bird that we don't see in Florida, in South Florida at least, every winter. Some winters, occasional winters, there are lots and lots of, of American robins. But mostly, most winters, we may only see a few, or sometimes we may not see any at all. This other eruptive bird, the yellow one with the black wings, anyone know what that one is? Yeah, that's an American goldfinch. So that's another eruptive species. They only show up in South Florida when the, su the food supplies further north uh, are not sufficient. If the food supplies further north, say in North Florida or Georgia, Alabama, if there's enough food for them in the winter, they'll stay there. They won't come any further south. But if the food supplies are not sufficient, that's when they come all the way down to South Florida to see if they can find enough food. So those kinds of birds, and there's only a few of those that I'll talk about in this presentation, the word that we use to describe those kind of birds are eruptive species. And then finally, the last category that I'm going to talk about are the exotics. These are the birds that do not belong here. They're from other parts of the world, maybe Central, South America, maybe even Southeast Asia. 
and they've been brought here either accidentally or they've been intentionally or unintentionally released here, and now they're breeding here and they're making a living here. So this is the red mass parakeet that I showed you in the first slide. So that's a bird from um, South America. And then this bird here, orange and black, is a type of oriole called a spot-breasted oriole. That's also from Central America. So I'll talk a little more about that when we get to the exotics. OK, let's talk a little more about uh, the birds that you can see in your backyard. Now, here on Key Biscayne, how many of you live here on Key Biscayne? Looks like just about all of you. OK. So if you live on Key Biscayne, you live near water. You're surrounded by water. We're an island. If you live on the mainland, you may live near a pond or a lake or a canal. All of those bodies of water attract birds. So if you live near fresh water, you may attract ducks. Oh, let me go back. You may attract ducks, like this model duck, which is a native duck to Florida. You may attract water birds like anhingas or cormorants. Or you may, the bodies of water may attract wading birds, like this great blue heron. Lots of different kinds of wading birds. This is called a common gallinule. It's a kind of rail. So that's a common bird in freshwater wetlands. If you live near salt water, you may see pelicans. We have two types of pelicans in Florida. The brown pelican, that's this one here, which is a year-round resident, and the American white pelican, which is only here in the wintertime. If you go to the beach, you may see shorebirds, like this ruddy turnstone, or gulls, like this laughing gull, or terns and relatives of terns, like these black skimmers. So the water attracts a massive diversity of different kinds of birds. So if you live near water and you want to see birds, living near water will also always produce more diversity than not living near water. Um, so you'll always produce a bigger list of birds if you live near water. What is this bird? Yeah, this is an ibis. What kind of ibis? Which one? White. Yeah, this is a white ibis. So the, the white ibis on the, adult, on the left is an adult. So when they're an adult, they're white. But this one often confuses people. This is an immature white ibis. So during the first year or so of its life, their, their body feathers are not white. They're more brownish. And then they will molt their feathers. They will lose the brown feathers. And they will grow in their white feathers when they become an adult. So I uh, highlight the white ibis because this is an example of a water bird that has become very, very urbanized. How many of you have seen a white ibis in your backyard? I have them in my backyard because I happen to live near water. But sometimes I'll even see them in parking lots. So they've become very, very urbanized. So this is a bird that 30, 40 years ago you wouldn't expect to see in your backyard. But now it's become a common backyard bird. But they have migrated from Africa about 300 years ago. No, not this one here. This one is native. The one that you're thinking of is the glossy ibis. Those are originally from Africa and then they came over to South America first, and then eventually made their way all the way up to North America. So that's glossy ibis, which is uh, it's very dark in color. All right, let's talk about birds that are um, probably familiar to you, the year-round residents. So this one should be familiar to all of you. Northern cardinal. Is this a male or a female? This is a male. The male is brightly colored. The female northern cardinal is more brownish with tones of red in it. And that's an example of what we call sexual dimorphism, where the males will look different than the females. So the males, typically, when sexual dimorphism occurs, the males will be more brightly colored. And that's to attract 
the females, and the females tend to be duller colored so that once they are nesting, they are not as attractive to predators. So that's why sexual dimorph dimorphism occurs. But it doesn't occur in every bird. For example, in this bird here, this is a, a blue jay. Males and females look pretty much alike. So there's no sexual dimorphism. So you, this is a very common bird in backyards. How about this bird? What is this? A mockingbird. Yeah, this is a northern mockingbird, which is our state bird. It's also the state bird of six other states. Uh, you would think that there would be better choices for state birds than this one, yeah. but uh, it's an extremely common bird. And uh, they're also um, experts at, at imitating other birds. So they have a very varied repertoire of songs. Isn't this a state bird of like six other states? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not the only one. Okay. So how many of you are hearing these singing right now? Outside your, maybe outside your window, sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning. Some of the unpaired males will sing all night in a desperate hope to attract a female. So that's the northern mockingbird. This is a relative of the northern mockingbird. It's another member of what is called the mimic thrush family. How many of you have ever seen this bird? What is this bird? Thrasher. Yeah, this is a brown thrasher. There are several different species of thrashers out west, but only one in the eastern United States. It's this one, the brown thrasher. Very beautiful bird and also a very good singer. OK, let's talk about doves. We have several different species of doves here in South Florida. Does anyone know what this one is? Morning dove. Yeah, that's a mourning dove. Why is it called a mourning dove? Because of the sound. Yeah, very mournful song that it sings, very, very sad sounding. So this is the mourning dove, a very common bird. This is a type of dove that is native just to the Caribbean. So Florida is the only place in the United States where you can see this bird. This bird is called the white crown pigeon. And I think it's aptly named for the white on the top of its head. This is a very beautiful bird. So it's about the same size as the common feral pigeon, what we call a rock pigeon, which I'll show you later. But rock pigeons don't have that white on the top of their head. So if you go to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, even the Yucatan Peninsula, anywhere around the Caribbean, you can see this bird. But if you want to see it in the United States, this is the only place to see it, South Florida. Another type of dove, very beautiful dove, that can be found right here on Key Biscayne. This is called the common ground dove. And this is the smallest of our doves. So you only see this bright kind of chestnut reddish color when they open their wings. So very beautiful dove. Woodpeckers. We have eight different species of woodpeckers. And this is probably the most likely woodpecker that you'll see in your backyard. Does anyone know the name of this woodpecker? Some people call this a red-headed woodpecker. There is a woodpecker called a red-headed woodpecker, but this isn't it. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. And I'm showing you a picture of a red-bellied woodpecker that actually has a red belly. Sometimes uh, you won't see, you'll have a hard time seeing that red belly. But that's why they call it a red-bellied woodpecker. The males, the belly is more brightly red than the females, and especially during the breeding season, the belly gets very red. But this is a red-bellied woodpecker. Even though it has a red head, a red-headed woodpecker, the whole head is red. And we don't have those here in Miami. You have to go maybe up to Palm Beach County or Collier County to see red-headed woodpeckers. But this is a very common woodpecker here in Miami. A couple of other woodpeckers. This is our smallest woodpecker. This is called a downy woodpecker. So you may have seen this in your backyard. And if you're really lucky, you'll see the largest of our eight woodpeckers. This is the pileated woodpecker. All of these woodpeckers are cavity nesters, so they need uh, dead or dying trees 
nest so that they can drill a hole for their nest. So I'll talk about why uh, snags, dead trees in your yard, can be attractive to birds like this that are cavity nesters. Let's talk about blackbirds now. This is the most common land bird in North America. It's black with red wings. So what is the name of this bird? The, right, exactly, the red-winged blackbird. Okay? So this is another example of a bird that uh, exhibits sexual dimorphism. This is the male. The females are kind of brownish in color and don't have the bright red and yellow in their wings. This is another type of blackbird in the same family as the um, red-winged blackbird. This is a type of bird called a grackle. We have two different species of grackles here in South Florida, and both of them can show up in backyards. This is the common grackle, which is smaller than the next one that I'll show you. And the key feature on this one is the yellow eye, because the other grackle here, the boat tail grackle, has a dark eye. So that's the easiest way to tell our two grackles apart. So boat tail grackle is bigger, has a longer tail, and with boat tail grackles, their sexual di they exhibit sexual dimorphism. So this is the male. The female is smaller, and it's more brown in color. Other types of blackbirds are called cowbirds, and we have three different species of those. This is the brown-headed cowbird. The males are black with a brown head. The females are mostly brown. We have two other cowbirds. The shiny cowbird, which is native to the Caribbean and um, is only otherwise found in Florida. This is another example of our Caribbean species that is found nowhere else in the United States other than Florida. So this is mostly a black bird, not very distinctive. Dark eye, sharp bill. And then the third species of cowbird that we have here is called the bronze cowbird. And the main distinguishing feature of the bronze cowbird is that bright red eye. So three different kinds of cowbirds can show up in backyards here. Brown-headed, shiny, and bronzed. Anyone know what this bird is? Its nickname is the butcher bird. This is called a loggerhead shrike. So there are many different species of shrikes. There's only a couple of them in North America. There's others in the old world. But the loggerhead shrike is called the butcher bird because it eats uh, lizards and small snakes and insects. But what it does is before it eats it, it will barbecue them in the sun. So it'll find a thorn or maybe a barb from that barb wire and it'll impale its prey on that thorn or barbed wire and let it bake in the sun for a few days, and then it'll go back and it'll eat it. Okay? So it's, it's obtained the nickname the butcher bird. This bird is a member of the flycatcher family. It's another cavity nester, like woodpeckers. It'll use old woodpecker holes to nest in. This is called a great crested flycatcher. There's lots of different kinds of flycatchers. I'll talk about more of them a little later. But this one here is the only one that may be breeding in your backyard. There are also hawks that can be found in your backyard. This is the most common hawk for backyards. This is the Cooper's hawk. It's a member of the Occipiter family. I'll show you one more member of this fa family a little later. This one here is now a year-round resident. It's only been the case for about, I'd say, the last 30 or 40 years. Previous to that, it was only here in the wintertime. But I'll show you a bird that was introduced to South Florida that probably caused these Cooper's hawks to stay all year because it became a very favorite prey item for these Cooper's hawks. So these are very, very fast birds. They're very uh, maneuverable. They can go through trees. They can fly through trees very fast. So they're well suited to living in backyard habitats. This is a short-tailed hawk. 
You may see this in your backyard. This is another species that, uh, another, um, it's a hawk species that if you want to see it in the United States, you have to come to Florida. They're found in Central and South America, but the only place in the United States you can see this one is in Florida. So this may be a bird that can show up in your backyard. And this is a bird that primarily eats other birds. And then the eastern screech owl may be found in backyards. How many of you have ever seen an eastern screech owl or heard an eastern screech owl? They're actually much more common than you would think. That you would think. Um, and at this time of the year, if you go out at night, if it's a clear night, probably tonight won't be a good night. But if you go to areas where these are, are found, you'll hear their vocalization. It sounds kind of like the whinnying of a horse. So that's the eastern screech owl. So that's one of six different species of owls that we have here in Florida, but the most likely one to see in backyards. So those are the resident birds. So now let's go through some of the birds that are here just in the summertime. They just come here to breed. Oop, went a little too fast. So I've already talked about the swallowtail kite. So those breed, I don't know if they breed here on Key Biscayne, but they breed in places like uh, Coral Gables and South Miami. Um, so very, very beautiful bird. This is called a purple martin. This is a member of the swallow family. How many of you have ever seen um, someone that um, put out in their yard nests for these particular kinds of swallows? They'll use a house, or sometimes they'll use gourds, uh, because these are cavity nesting birds. And in the eastern United States, they have now become completely dependent on human beings for providing places for them to nest. In the western United States, especially in the southwestern United States, they will still nest in like cactus and things like that, holes in a cactus. But in the eastern United States, they'll only nest in houses that are provided them, for them by people. So people will set up houses for them because they're insect eaters. They're um, what are called aerial insectivores. So they eat insects on the wing while flying. And they like mosquitoes. So people will set up purple martin houses to attract these birds to lower the mosquito population. So this is a male, which is all purple. The female has a white belly. This is a chimney swift. This is a bird that literally will nest in chimneys. So they actually nest here in Miami. And you may be wondering, where are there a lot of chimneys here in Miami? Well, if you go to places like Pinecrest and Coral Gables, a lot of the houses actually have chimneys. So this bird will nest here. They've only been nesting here for the last probably 40 or 50 years. It's a relatively uh, new nesting bird for this area. This is a common nighthawk. This is a bird that's here from about April to uh, September or October. And you may hear these at night, but you don't often see them. So this is uh, a picture of one that was taken in the daytime. When it's rainy, they may come out during the daytime. But most of the time, they hunt for insects at night. And they have very, very big mouths, which they open up. And they're, they're also aerial insectivores. So they'll eat insects on the wing. So that's common nighthawk. Here's the gray kingbird that I showed you at the beginning. This is another type of flycatcher. So they nest here. They like to nest in uh, shopping center parking lots because they, they like more open areas. So they'll nest in trees in the medians of the parking lot. And then they'll hunt for insects in the open areas of the parking lot. But sometimes they will show up in backyards. So you may see this in your backyard. This is a type of bird called a vireo. This is a black whiskered vireo. It's another Caribbean bird, only found in the Caribbean and South Florida. And I'll show you some other vireos a little later. It's called a black whiskered vireo because of this little stripe here below its bill. So black whiskered vireo. 
Okay, let's move on to migrants and winter visitors. This is probably the most common migrant songbird that you'll see in your backyard. This is called a blue-gray gnatcatcher, and it's a very tiny bird with a white eye ring and white along the tail, and they make a little mewing sound. That's their vocalization. So this is blue-gray gnatcatcher. This is another member of the mimic thrush family. It's related to mockingbirds and thrashers. This is a gray cat, cat bird, so mostly gray with a, a black cap and red under the tail. So it's a type of mimic thrush. So they're only here from about October to April. This is a house wren. We have several different types of wren. This is the most likely one to, for you to see in your backyard. It's a plain brown bird, but it has a pretty song. This is the only species of woodpecker that you're likely to see in your backyard in the wintertime. We have eight different species of woodpeckers in Florida, but this is the only one that's not here year round. So if you want to see this one, you have to wait until the wintertime. This bird is called a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Okay, so not all woodpeckers have the word woodpecker in their names. There are flickers, and this one here is a sapsucker, yellow-bellied sapsucker. This is a relative of the common nighthawk. This is called a Chuck Will's widow. And they're called a Chuck Will's widow because the call that they make sounds like it's saying Chuck Will's widow, which they repeat over and over again all night. Chuck Will's widow, Chuck Will's widow, Chuck Will's widow, all night. I do surveys for these birds in the Everglades, and I can go at midnight and hear them calling. So as soon as it gets dark, they start calling. As soon as it starts getting light again in the morning, they stop calling, and they're very, very hard to find. OK, here's that American Red Star. This is one of those warblers. This is the male. It, it's mostly black. It has orange in the wings along the flanks and in the tail and then a white belly. This is another example of a bird with sexual dimorphism. The female, instead of being black, it's more a, a grayish color, and instead of orange, it's yellow. Is that red? American red start, okay? S-T-A-R-T. So that word start, it's an old kind of I wouldn't say Old English, but it's a word that's not used very often anymore. And it just refers to um, colors in the tail that flash. So it, it, it startles other birds when it flashes that. So it's probably uh, to scare off predators. Here's another warbler called the northern perula, very beautiful bird with that yellow breast and yellow throat. This is a prairie warbler, so yellow with black stripes. This is a black-throated blue warbler. So you can see the blue on the head and the back and on the wings and the black throat and along the flanks, the white on the breast and the white on the wing. The female looks completely different. It's not blue. It doesn't have a black throat. The only thing it shares in common with the male is that white spot on the wing. Otherwise, it's a very dull looking bird, just kind of brownish looking. So this is called a black-throated blue warbler. Beautiful bird. This is a yellow-throated warbler, another beautiful warbler. So obviously named yellow-throated warbler because of that bright yellow throat. Males and females look alike in this one. This is a black and white warbler, obviously named because it's white with black stripes. This is an oven bird. This is an example of a warbler that likes to walk on the ground like a little chicken. So it's brown with a white breast with black streaks, and you can see that orange crest, which you usually only see when the bird is um, threatened or excited and then it'll raise that crest. 
So that's called an oven bird. And they're called an oven bird because the uh, nest that they build, they don't nest here. They nest in the Appalachians and further north. But the nest that they build is shaped like a little Dutch oven. This is a palm warbler, really common bird here in the wintertime. Uh, they like to feed on the ground. They'll feed on insects just hopping around on the ground. So they have the yellow under the tail and the kind of brownish uh, cap and with that yellow stripe above the eye. So that's called a palm warbler. This is a yellow rumped warbler. And that yellow rump is visible in this photo, but it's not always visible when you see this bird. So this can be a bird that will confuse people. They're not exactly sure what it is. But it has yellow on the flanks and yellow on the rump. Here are some more examples of vireos. These are vireos that are here just during migration or in the wintertime. This is a red-eyed vireo. So we only see this one during the spring and the fall. You can see that beautiful red eye. This is a white-eyed vireo. So you can see the white eye on this bird. This is a blue-headed vireo. And this is a, a yellow-throated vireo. So there are several different kinds of vireos that could be found here, either during migration or during the wintertime. There's that ruby-throated hummingbird which actually nest here in South Florida, but not in residential areas, just in the interior of the state. Here's another hummingbird that, is, that shows up sometimes in, in Miami. This is called a rufous hummingbird. This is actually native to the western United States. They'll uh, nest as far north as Alaska. But in the wintertime, they'll come south and some of them will come not only south, but they'll come east, and they'll show up as far south as Miami. So very different from the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is the male, which has a, a very bright red uh, throat, uh, or orangey throat. The females are much duller colored. So that's called a rufous hummingbird. Anyone know what this bird is? Not an indigo. It's a bunting, but what kind of bunting? Could be called a rainbow bunting, but the actual name for this bird is the painted bunting. Painted bunting, so a beautiful bird. Probably the most colorful songbird in North America. They don't nest in South Florida, but they winter here. And they're a very popular bird for backyard birders that like to set up feeders to try to attract these birds. They're a seed eater. So people will put up bird seed, put out bird seed for these birds, and during the wintertime, they'll come to their feeders. So this is the male, very, very colorful. The female is all green. And the young males are also all green. During their first year of life, they look identical to the females. And then in their second year, they'll start to uh, molt uh, all the green feathers, and then they'll bring in the red and the blue and all these beautiful colors. So that's a painted, painted bunting. And then the other bunting that can show up here was just mentioned. This is the indigo bunting, also very beautiful, though not as varied in, in color. It's almost all blue. How long are they here? They're here just during spring and fall migration, and some of them will winter but not as commonly as the painted bunting. This is a type of tanager that will show up in, uh, during migration, spring and fall, and uh, some of them will winter. This is called a summer tanager. So beautiful bird. This is the male, all red. The females are more uh, orangey or brownish in color. And then the other tanager that we'll get, but only during migration, they don't winter here, is the scarlet tanager. So this is red with black wings and a black tail. Very beautiful bird. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak. So this is the male, which has that rose breast. The females are more brownish. Another beautiful bird that we see here mostly during migration. And this is a Baltimore oriole. We'll see these during migration, and some will winter here. So orange with a black head. 
So that's Baltimore Oreo. Here's the relative of the Cooper's hawk, uh, another member of the Occipiter family that is only here in the wintertime. This is a sharp-shinned hawk. This is a much smaller hawk than a Cooper's hawk. This is only about the size of a blue jay. It's very, very small, but it'll come down here in the wintertime and it'll also show up in backyards because it likes to hunt for the birds, especially if someone has feeders that are attracting birds like painted buntings. These birds will try to eat those birds. So this is a sharp shinned hawk. Okay, let's talk quickly about the eruptives. Remember, eruptives are those birds that only show up in South Florida when there's not enough food for them up north during the wintertime. So this is called a cedar waxwing. This is an absolutely gorgeous bird. And they'll show up, especially in the springtime, in large flocks. They like eating the berries of um, strangler figs. So sometimes you'll see flocks of up to 200 of these birds. Uh, they're not big. Uh, they're maybe only about five inches long. But if you can get a look at them up close, you can see how beautiful they are. This is a member of the silky flycatcher family. So they have a very silky look to them. Cedar waxwing. There's the American robin. So sometimes we'll see lots of these in the wintertime. Other winters, we won't see any at all. Here's the American goldfinch. When we get American goldfinches here in Florida in the wintertime, they don't look like this. This is what they look, look like in, in their breeding plumage further north, but then they molt into a much duller plumage. There's still some yellow on them, but nowhere near as much as during the breeding season. So very beautiful bird, American goldfinch. This is a ruby-crowned kinglet. We occasionally get these here in the wintertime, and they'll show up in parks or backyards. And you can see why it's called a ruby crown kinglet. This is another example of uh, a crown on a bird that only appears when the bird is agitated. And then it'll raise that crest up. Otherwise, you won't see that red at all. Ruby crown kinglet. All right, let's talk about the exotics. These are the introduced birds. So this one should be familiar to all of you. All of you are familiar with pigeons. But for birders, there's, or scientists, bird scientists, ornithologists, this has an actual name to it. It's called a rock pigeon. These are native to Europe and Asia. And they've been introduced throughout North America, really throughout the world. They're found just about everywhere except Antarctica. Here's another species of dove that's been introduced here. This is called the Eurasian collared dove. This was originally introduced to the Bahamas, and then they showed up in South Florida. And now they are over much of North America. And this is the bird that is now the favored prey species for the Cooper's hawk. So these showed up in, back in the 80s. And by the 90s, Cooper's hawks found so many of these birds to eat that many of them decided to nest here. So now many Cooper's hawks are staying here year round. So this is called Eurasian collared dove. Here's another introduced dove to South Florida. This is called the white winged dove. This is native to the southeast, uh, southwestern United States, the desert habitats, uh, Mexico, down into Central America. White winged dove. This bird here has become one of the um, pest species among the introduced species to Florida. This is the European starling. It is a cavity nester. It was originally introduced to Central Park in New York and has since spread throughout North America. And this bird is, has become a pest because it can outcompete native cavity nesting birds like woodpeckers, or purple martins, uh, birds like that. So this is um, not a, a good introduction to North America. This, uh, this was a mistake to introduce this bird here. Same thing with this bird. Are they all dotted like that? Yeah, they, uh, they'll, the uh, adults will look different than the uh, immature birds. If I can go back. 
this is more of an immature bird. The adults are not quite as spotted as that. So this is an immature bird. What's this bird? Yeah, this is a house sparrow, another introduced bird from uh, Europe, uh, and also kind of a pest species because it's also a cavity nester, and it can be very aggressive in trying to um, take over the uh, cavity nest of a native bird. So another kind of problematic bird. This is a house finch. This is a bird that is native to the western United States. And we have some of these in Miami. It's not a very common bird. Uh, places like uh, Palmetto Bay, um, Cutler Bay, that area, seem to have um, a pretty established population of this bird. This is the male, which has the red in it. The females uh, don't have the red in it. They're much more duller colored. So that's called pet trade, this has a different name. It's called a Quaker parakeet. But uh, for birders, we call them monk parakeets. Two more different kinds of parakeets. On the left is the yellow chevron parakeet. On the right is the white, uh, white wing parakeet. These two parakeets used to be considered the same species. They're both from South America. They were considered, they were originally called canary wing parakeet. And then ornithologists, the scientists that study birds, decided that they were actually different species. So on the left, yellow chevron. On the right, white wing parakeet. So you can see a little bit of white in the wing of the white, white wing parakeet. Uh, the other way that you can tell the difference is on the white wing parakeet, the head is kind of grayish. On the yellow chevron, it's much more green like the rest of its body. This is a mitered parakeet, very similar to the um, red mass parakeet that I showed you at the beginning, but it has less red on its body, especially on its head. This is called an orange-winged parrot. So I should mention how you tell parakeets from parrots. Did you happen to notice that all of the parakeets that I've shown you so far had much longer tails than this bird? So that's the easiest way to distinguish a parakeet from a parrot. Parakeets have long tails. Parrots have short tails. So this orange-winged parrot is from Central and South America. And you can see, oh, let me go back. You can see the, um, the orange in the wing. That's the only time that you can see the orange in an orange-winged parrot is when it's flying. All right, back to this beautiful bird. 
How many of you have ever seen this one in Miami? Excellent, okay. It's, when you see them, they're very conspicuous because they're huge. This is called a blue and yellow macaw. They're native to South America. And there's only a handful of these that are in Miami. Uh, the population grew to about 40 individuals um, back in the 90s and the early 2000s. Now it's shrunk. Poaching has been a big problem for this bird uh, because they're very popular in the pet trade. And so now the population is only down to uh, less than 20 birds. Okay? But uh, if you go around the University of Miami, sometimes you can see almost the entire population in one big flock because they do like to flock together. So a beautiful bird, one of two species of macaws that we have here in Miami. The other is the chestnut fronted macaw, which is smaller than this one. I showed you this one before. This is the um, this is a type of oriole, the spot-breasted oriole. So you can see the black spots on its breast where it gets its name. This is native to um, Central America and Mexico. They were introduced to South Florida in the late 1940s, and they're only found in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. Spot-breasted oriole. They have a beautiful song. This is a red-whiskered bulbul. If you want to see one of these, you have to go to either Kendall or Pinecrest. These were introduced to Miami in the 1960s, but they never really spread from where they were introduced. They were introduced, uh, they escaped from an aviary that was on US 1 and uh, Southwest 104th Street. And um, they, they only spread into Kendall and Pinecrest, probably down maybe to Palmetto Bay but never any further north or south than that. So this is a bird from Southeast Asia. This is another bird from Southeast Asia. It's one of the two species of miners that we have here in Florida that have been introduced. This is called the hill miner. If you want to see this bird, the best place to see it is Fairchild Gardens in Coral Gables and Matheson Hammock Park, which is right next door. So the common miner you can see if you go to shopping centers, because they're a terrestrial miner, they feed on the ground, they'll go up on the wires. But this miner is much larger, and it's more arboreal, which means it uh, prefers to live in trees. So you generally see them up in the trees. And they have uh, very loud calls, so you oftentimes will hear this bird before you ever see it. Back uh, 20 years ago, I used to see flocks of 30 or 40 of these, but now we only see maybe two or three. So this is another bird that it's a very popular bird in the pet trade, and it's probably been poached, the birds that are here in Miami. So they've become very, very uncommon. It's called hill miner. But you've probably all seen this non-native duck. This is a Muscovy duck. Uh, they uh, breed like rabbits, so they're very, very common in residential areas, but you won't see them in, in places like the Everglades. So they're very dependent on people to feed them. Though they will feed on grass and things like that on their own. Here's the other species of waterfowl that's become very, very common here. This is the Egyptian goose. It was probably introduced to South Florida uh, originally at Crandon Gardens, right here on Key Biscayne, and they have since spread throughout much of Florida. So as the name suggests, this is a bird that's originally, it's native to Africa, but it's now become very, very common in South Florida, especially in parks and golf courses. Egyptian goose. And then if you've ever been to Crandon Gardens, you've seen this one. This is the Indian peafowl, native to India. This is the male. And this is a bird that people have a love-hate relationship with. Some people just love these birds. Other people, because they're noisy, because they're messy, um, they don't have as much of a love affair. But certainly one of the most beautiful birds in the world. So Indian peafowl. Okay, 
a bonus category, Caribbean vagrants, birds to watch out for that sometimes show up from the Caribbean in South Florida, and they could show up in backyards, so birds to watch for. Oh, going the wrong way. This is called a banana quit. Very, very common, a small bird, tiny songbird, um, in its own family, found throughout the Caribbean and in Central and South America. Um, one of these showed up uh, in um, Bill Bagg's Cape Florida State Park last month. It hasn't been reported in the last few weeks. It may still be there. But they occasionally will show up. And Key Biscayne is one of the more likely places for them to show up. So they're in the Bahamas. They're in Cuba. And that's probably where birds um, come from that show up in South Florida. Would that fly here? Yeah, believe it or not. Well, remember, ruby-throated hummingbirds will fly all the way from Central America across the Gulf of Mexico to Florida nonstop. So birds are just amazing with, in their ability to, to fly. This bird here is called a western spindalis. It's found in the Bahamas and Cuba. And it has often shown up here in South Florida and here on Key Biscayne. Uh, this is the male. The female is much more dull colored. This is a Zenaida dove, very similar to a morning dove. The difference is it's much more reddish in color, and it has that white in the wings, and a shorter tail, not so pointed. If this bird shows up in your backyard, you need to contact somebody at Tropical Audubon Society. This is a real rare one. This is a bird from the Bahamas. It's called the Bahamas Woodstar. Obviously, it's a hummingbird. It's uh, native to the Bahamas. It's endemic to the Bahamas, meaning it's found nowhere else in the world except the Bahamas. And it shows up in Florida very, very rarely. This is, uh, this is the first of, I guess, the next one will be another example of the only birds in this presentation that I've never seen in Florida. So I'm still hoping to see one. I've seen them in the Bahamas. What's it called? It's called a Bahama wood star. So a wood star is a, 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 a subgroup of hummingbirds. There are other species of wood stars. This is the Bahama wood star. We're going to find one to call you. Excellent. Here's the other hummingbird that I'm hoping that one day we'll see in South Florida. People have uh, claimed to have seen these. But no one's ever taken a photograph of this one. This is called a Cuban emerald. It's found in the, only in the Bahamas and Cuba. So we're hoping that this one will one day show up. And one of the more likely places, if it's going to show up, will be right here in Key Biscayne. Probably a bird from the Bahamas. And then finally, this bird here is called a Cuban bullfinch. And the, it's only shown up once in South Florida. But we're not sure if it showed up on its own or if it was a bird that escaped from somebody that was keeping it as a pet. It showed up in somebody's backyard in South Miami. And uh, it just so happened that that backyard belonged to the mother-in-law of the president of Tropical Audubon Society. So he's the one that found it and told uh, his birding friends, including me. So we all got his permission to go and see this bird when it was in his mother-in-law's backyard in South Miami. So this is native to uh, Cuba and the Cayman Islands. And um, like I said, I've seen this in Florida, but I'm not sure if it came here on its own. Because there are a lot of, of these birds that are kept as pets. Um, so it's more likely that this bird arrived here via someone's uh, cage and just escape. OK, so now that you've seen how many different birds can show up in backyards, let's talk a little bit about how we can make birds more attractive and more safe for birds that are using backyards as year-round habitat or stopover habitat if they're migrants. So some of the things that you can do to make um, a backyard more attractive to birds. First,
plant bird friendly native trees and shrubs. On Saturday, this Saturday and Sunday, Tropical Audubon Society will be having its annual native plant sale. So if you'd like to buy some native plants to plant in your backyard, this weekend, weather permitting, will be an excellent opportunity. Millions of birds every year die due to collisions with windows and there are ways to prevent that by putting stickers on your windows to make it less reflective, to just close, close the blinds, things like that will prevent uh, birds from colliding with windows. Yes. Right, so he's pecking on the window. Cardinals like to do that. What they're doing there, it's usually the male, and when they see a bird, when they see a reflection of themselves in the mirror, they think it's another cardinal. So they think it's a competitor. So they'll peck at it to try to chase it away because they don't understand the concept of mirrors or reflections. Right. It, as long as it's reflective and it can see its reflection in its window, it'll peck at it. But that's, that's not usually going to injure or kill the bird. It's usually when the bird is flying and it sees a reflection in the window of trees and it thinks that it's more trees and it flies right into the window and they can have concussions and they can die from that. So like I said, many, many birds die from that. We have lots of buildings in Miami with lots of very reflective windows. And we, Tropical Audubon Society has started a program called Lights Out Miami, where we're hoping to convince the county to convince building owners to turn off their lights at night because most songbirds, like warblers and buntings, they actually migrate at night. And when they migrate over cities, they're attracted to the lights. And then once the sun comes up and they want to continue their journey, they are among all these tall buildings and they get confused. And if there are reflective windows, they crash into it. And a lot of them are killed that way. So we're trying to encourage that lights be turned off at night during migration, spring and fall, to prevent birds from being attracted to those lights and end up crashing into windows. So make windows bird safe. Keep cats indoors. Cats, outdoor cats, kill millions of birds every year. Studies have shown this, that cats, even if they don't eat the bird, they'll kill it because it's just instinctive. So we lose millions of birds every year due to outdoor cats. So if you own a cat, it's better for the cat to keep it indoors. Feral cats, if you go to a park and you see feral cats that are living there, they live miserable lives. They can get hit by cars, they get killed by other animals, uh, they get diseases. So the best thing to do for any cat is to keep it indoors. And then you can participate in a bird-related citizen science activity, and I'll give some examples of that in a couple of minutes. Now, if you have a backyard and you want to plant native trees, uh, and you want to go to our native plant sale at uh, Tropical Audubon Society's headquarters, which is the Doc Thomas House, which is 5530 uh, Sunset Drive in South Miami, and you want to have a shopping list, 
of trees, that good trees, native trees, to plant in your backyard. You can take your phone out and take a photo of this list. We do have this information on our website, which I'll give you in a minute. But these are some of the native trees that are very attractive to birds. Either they produce fruit that attracts the birds that are fruit eating, or it'll attract insects for inse insectivores, birds that eat insects. So different figs, short leaf and strangler fig, soldier wood, gumbo limbo, satin li uh, leaf, Bahama straw, strongback, wild tamarind, live oak, and lancewood are all excellent native trees. They're, they're native to South Florida that are very attractive to birds. Shrubs are also important for cover where birds can hide. So lots of different examples of bird-friendly native shrubs. Different stoppers, um, American beauty, uh, beauty berry, uh, fire bush is very attractive to hummingbirds. So lots of different uh, shrubs that are native that we encourage you to plant in your backyard. Okay, some citizen science. So um, every year Tropical Audubon Society runs a Christmas bird count where we do surveys to see uh, how populations of birds in the wintertime in Miami are changing from year to year. So you can participate in a Christmas bird count Every year, Audubon, the Audubon Society has what's called the Great Backyard Bird Count that occurs during February. So you can count the birds that you see in your backyard. And there's a way to submit that information online. So this is the website for that. If you have feeders in your backyard, you can participate in what's called Project Feeder Watch. So you can um, report what kind of birds are appearing at your feeders. And then if you just like to look at birds and identify them and count them, you can use eBird, which was created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at Cornell University in New York. And you can just report your birds online, even using your phone. There's an eBird app that you can use, and you can go out in your backyard or in a local park, and it'll produce a list of birds for that location. And once you see it, you just enter it in eBird, and then it goes into the database. So any, and anyone anywhere in the world can look at what you've been seeing. So that's called eBird. And finally, if you'd like to learn more about Tropical Audubon Society, uh, our website is simply tropicalaudubon.org. So does anyone have any questions? about backyard birds or how to attract those birds. Of? Yes, there are. Black vultures and turkey vultures. Uh, the turkey vultures um, are, are, both black vultures and turkey vultures are here year round. But in the wintertime, lots of turkey vultures from further north come up down here because there's not enough food for them in their breeding grounds up north, you know, say in New York or Pennsylvania, places like that. So they'll come down to warmer areas where there's much more food for them. But it looks like there's nothing for them to eat in Crenshaw Park either, but I've seen them eat coconuts. You, I don't think they eat coconuts. Yeah, They're, I've seen them eating coconuts. Really? Okay. Their uh, uh, vultures are scavengers. They eat dead things normally. And there are lots of roadkill, things like that. So they do provide that service. But uh, black vultures are here year round. Turkey vultures, some year round. Most of them here just in the wintertime. Yes? How long did it take you to take all of these pictures? I didn't take any, any of these pictures. I borrowed all of these from the internet. Yeah, I try to take some, you know, uh, some really colorful pictures of the birds. You know, they're much better photographers than me. I do have a camera, but uh, I would never be able to get the. F yeah, really, it would take a lifetime to take a, a long lens. Yeah, heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Question. Any other question? Yes. So how do they keep the balance? I see the birds over there. 
But is it the, the force that they have in the club, or is it a balance or the wings? How do they keep, you know, when they're standing in the air? Yeah, when, once they will land on a tree branch, their claws will close around that branch, and they can hold on pretty tight, and they just have a, just an instinctive sense of balance. So, I mean, if it's windy, you'll see sometimes that the birds are, you know, moving back and forth, but they'll just hold on tight, or if they feel themselves uh, losing their balance, they'll open their wings and they'll, you know, try to get another perch. Yeah, so that's how they do it. They, they learn very, very quickly how to do it. That's a really good question. I remember during Hurricane Andrew, uh, where I live in West Kendall, there were a lot of grackles that would roost in the trees in where I live, and it, a lot of them didn't survive. So during a very serious hurricane, the birds will just try to find any shelter they can. So, you know, little uh, underneath a bush or in some little crevice somewhere. They'll find places to go to hide. And it's amazing if it's not a, a very severe hurricane, you'll see the birds become active as soon as the, the weather has passed. So they, they birds can actually, um, they can uh, sense changes in barometric pressure. So when the barometric pressure goes very low, when a hurricane is coming, they can actually sense that and they'll take cover before the, the strong winds actually start. So birds are amazing. They have senses. They can, they can sense magnetic fields. Uh, they have all sorts of senses that, uh, that we don't have that help them to survive. Also, they have, uh, in Brandon Park, we have lots of crows. Yes, we have two, crow, two crows here, fish crows, which are in the city, American crows in the Everglades. Um, the fish crows will migrate or they'll go to roosting areas. So uh, there'll be some times of the year, especially the winter time, where you'll see many more fish crows than you will uh, now in the summertime. Um, but uh, they're here year round. There will be some here year round. What do the mockingbirds mean the other birds? It's just a, a niche that they've adapted to, that uh, they're, they've learned to, um, to uh, be able to recreate the songs of other birds. Sometimes they'll, um, they'll start a mimic a, a bird, like a migrant bird, like say a gray kingbird. They'll start mimicking that bird even before the gray kingbirds themselves uh, show up for the breeding season. So sometimes, uh, most times they'll learn it from their parents, but they may learn it themselves later in life from the actual bird that they're mimicking. And then they have just a vast repertoire of songs that are just mockingbird songs, different vocalizations that they make that are not really mimicking another bird. But they're, they have an amazing ability to learn the songs of other birds. And that still attracts. It's all to attract the female, yeah. So the better the repertoire, the more impressed the female is. That's how it works. Yes? Um, so I've heard stories of birds getting caught up in, in storms, like hurricanes. Mm -hmm. um, and not just like, you know, sucked into the wind, but like m caught maybe in the eye or in the right. middle and just basically having to move with the storm. Right, like yeah, seabirds, that that's, happens a lot with seabirds. So after a hurricane, once the hurricane goes inland, uh, like say if it lands in Louisiana and then goes up the Mississippi Delta, a lot of seabirds from the Gulf of Mexico will get trapped in the eye of the storm and they'll have to follow the eye as it moves inland. And then these birds that uh, you know, are normally just out, way out at sea, they'll be found in you know, Kentucky and Arkansas and Missouri, places like that. And then either they find their way back or sometimes they don't make it, but they, they never find their way back. So yeah, that does happen during, during hurricanes. Do you know of any of that happening in Florida, bringing like strange birds Oh, absolutely, to absolutely. So birders sometimes, uh, you know, we like to see rare birds. 
So sometimes when we know that a storm is coming, like this uh, storm system that's coming from Mexico, we're hoping that maybe some of the birds from Mexico uh, follow that storm and end up here. So uh, I know that sounds, you know, it's not in the best interest of the birds, but uh, you know, there's nothing, we have no control over it. So if a bird happens to show up here accidentally as a result of a storm, and we have a chance to go see it, we'll take advantage of that. Okay, one more question. Flamingos. Yep. I have read that they are both native and not native. I think they're native. Personally. They are now officially considered a native species by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. We finally convinced them that they are native. They were breeding in South Florida uh, as recently as the late 1800s. Um, John James Audubon, uh, that the Audubon Society is named after, ornithologist from the uh, 1800s. He saw flamingos when he visited Florida that were nesting here, but they were the victims of plume hunters that uh, shot birds like flamingos and herons and egrets uh, for their feathers. He mostly to use in, in the hat industry for ladies' hats. So that decimated the flamingo population and they haven't nested uh, in South Florida since then. So the flamingos that are seen here in Florida, we assume that they're from populations from elsewhere in the Caribbean, either the Yucatan, where there are tens of thousands of flamingos, or Cuba or the Bahamas. And they uh, will just accidentally show up here. But there's um, what's called the American Flamingo Working Group. Uh, it's a, um, collection of scientists from Zoo Miami and uh, from Florida Fish and Wildlife and other organizations that uh, are trying to figure out a way to reintroduce American flamingos and find a place where um, the, it would be suitable for them to nest, probably in the Everglades. So that's something that may happen in the next few decades. If they can figure out uh, a good place to reintroduce them, they may try to do that. And once again, if they're successful, flamingos will be nesting here in Florida. We'll see if that happens. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yes? Uh, a lot of time when I go outside, I see mockingbirds, uh, like by bombing crows and stuff. Is there a reason why they do that? It's really, it's just they're being protective of their territory. Uh, that usually occurs most, most often during the nesting season. So any bird that they consider a threat uh, they'll try to chase it away. So even if it's not a bird that will necessarily threaten their babies, um, they don't take any chances. They'll just chase everything away. So mockingbirds can be very aggressive that way. They'll even chase away people. Yeah, their crows are, are land land-dwelling birds. So the fish, fish crows will be found around water, but generally they don't like to fly over water. So crows are actually very rare in the Keys. We very rarely see either of our two species of crows in the Keys. There's a small population of fish crows in Key West, but otherwise in the Keys, it's very rare to see a crow. And it's because they don't like to Cross a body of water to get there. Yeah, so that's true. Um, I have two questions on Zoom. Uh, first, do migratory birds fly at a certain altitude? I'm specifically wondering about the ruby-throated hummingbird that you were talking about uh, from Central America that flies over the Gulf to Florida. It really differs depending on species. Uh, I mean, there was there will be some um, migrant birds that will fly thousands of feet. Uh, over the, the, uh, the water or the land uh, when they're migrating. Other birds will fly closer to the ground. Um, with ruby-throated hummingbirds, they probably don't get very, very high in altitude, you know, because it, there's a lot of expenditure of energy to get higher in altitude. So they're probably flying closer to the surface. Okay, uh, the second question, um, how long did it take to convince the state government to make uh, the flamingo considered native? It, that just happened uh, a 
year ago, two years ago. So oh, it's taken, like it's taken quite a while. Group. Yeah, I mean, even before the, uh, this working group, there was an effort to try to convince um, the state of Florida to officially designate the flamingo as a native species, because it was really a mistake. I mean, if you look at, at the... Uh,